Thank you, Oliver. It's a pleasure to be opening up the show, the very first Pixel Pioneers. Uh, it's an honor. Uh, hello, everybody. Hello. Um, well, okay, uh, going to kick off today. I'm going to kick off today by showing you some code. Who wants to see some code? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, here's some, here's some code. Uh, this is uh, literally a picture of code. Uh, this is the, the famous uh, photograph 51. The code base here is deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. Uh, yeah, this, this is an incredible picture. It is literally a photograph of DNA. Uh, photograph 51, taken by Rosalind Franklin, the uh, X-ray crystallographer. And it was thanks to her work that we were then able to you know, decode the structure of DNA, uh, the base code, ACGT. So base four, rather than binary, base two that we normally work with on computers, but still, you know, very, very simple building blocks. And with this, these very simple building blocks in DNA, we get all life on our planet. Literally every life form on our planet shares the same fundamental building blocks, right? Whether it's, it's humans, or elephants, or ostriches, or fish, or birds, or trees, or plants, it's all the same code base. An incredible variety of life on our planet. But when you look at this variety of life, you start to see some, some trends, some trends in the world of nature, like this trend towards specialization, that a life form gets really, really good at doing, doing one thing, right? Ubiquity, life finds a way, right? trying to spread across the planet, trying to spread as far as po possible. And really interestingly, cooperation, that more could be accomplished by a group than can be accomplished by an individual. Um, so this is the way that life tends to happen, is, right? as there's this messy process of, uh, of natural selection, evolution through natural selection, and over time, because of mistakes getting propagated that are fit for the environment, uh, you get these life forms specialized and ubiquitous and cooperating. Um, we tend to think of ourselves as being some kind of superior life form, right? We're the, the, the head of the, the evolutionary chain. But the, the truth is that every life form on the planet is the most highly evolved life form there could be because it's still here, right? Every life form that's still around is evolved for its environment. But this process, evolution through natural selection, which is amazing, but it's, it's slow, it's slow and it's messy. And the one thing we have managed is to kind of hack the process, find a way to, to go a little bit faster, to augment ourselves a little bit faster. And that's through technology. Now, through technology, we can yeah, give ourselves augmentation uh, without having to wait for the messy process of you know, mutation, natural selection, evolution. So here's an example of uh, a technology. Uh, this is the Ashwalian hand axe. Um, it's certainly ubiquitous, you know, specialized tool, ubiquitous, um, found all across the world. And, and by use of this tool, we humans could have a sharp-edged cutting implement at the end of our limb without having to evolve a sharp-edged cutting implement at the end of our limb. So we kind of found a, a way of jump-starting the, the process to augment ourselves. And then we shape our tools, and the tools shape us. And the history of technology has been pretty much that repeated. The tools get more complicated, uh, but we're augmenting ourselves without having to wait for, for natural selection to do its thing. Uh, take a tool like the pencil. Great tool. I love the pencil. Um, it's got a fantastic affordance. You can see which bit you're supposed to use. It has a built-in progress bar, which is very handy, <laughs> and uh, even has an undo. And it, the thing is, if you look at the history of, of technology, you start to notice some similarities with the history of biology. You start to see the same kind of trends that you see in nature. This trend towards specialization, right? The pencil's really good at doing one thing. Uh, ubiquity, you will find pencils all over the world, more or less in the same uh, form factor. Uh, and cooperation. There's a great book uh, by Leonard Reed called I Pencil, told from the point of view of a pencil. And the book makes the point that no single human being can make a pencil. 
Right? There's just too many things involved for one human to try and do it all. It requires cooperation right? to, to fell the trees, to get the graphite, to put it all together. There's just uh, so, many, so many complicated steps involved that no one person could try it. I mean, you can attempt to create a piece of technology literally from scratch, but you're going to have a bad time. Um, there was the artist uh, Thomas Twaits. He attempted this. You might have seen his most recent piece of work where he attempted to live for a year as a goat. Uh, this is an earlier project called the Toaster Project where he attempted to make a toaster from scratch, like literally from scratch. He, he wanted to mine the metals, he wanted to smelt them, create plastic, uh, and somehow get it working. Um, and it did work for about a second. Uh, for it burned out, and it, it was prohibitively expensive. So when it comes to technology, this, this cooperation is, it seems to be built in, right? So, so that specialization, the ubiquity, the cooperation. And when you, when you see those similarities between technology and biology, it would be tempting to think that, it, well, they're, they're basically the same process. Right? But, but no, the very different processes. Like I said, in biology, this, this slow, messy process of natural selection which is an amazing process, but it takes a long time. Uh, whereas in, in technology, you begin with, with the thought, you begin with the idea of what you want, and then you make it happen. That's the opposite to how nature works. Right? Nature doesn't set out to make an elephant or an ostrich or a fish. It just that happens to be the end result of evolution through natural selection. Whereas with technology, we can imagine something and then bring it into the world. Right? That's, that's a fairly fundamental difference. Um, and we can then, you know, imbue our technologies with ideas. One of my favorite sort of schools of thought around technology is a, a school called Chindogu. comes out of Japan. It literally means sort of strange tool or strange device. Uh, and Chindogu are described as being not exactly useful, but somehow not altogether useless. Okay? Um, it's been going since 1995, there's a Shindogu society. I, if you see them, you kind of get what I mean. It's like you look at these things and you think, well, that's kind of stupid, but actually, maybe, well, it's like, is it crazy? Is it genius? I can't decide. I look at this, it's like, that's crazy. Well, I, don't, I can imagine it, right? It's not, it, these, are, these are described as being unuseless, unuseless technologies, you know, keeping your, keeping your shit. Well, I mean, why not? Why not? Harness the kinetic energy of your toddler to clean your floors. It kind of makes sense, right? And if you don't have a child, that's okay. It still works with other technologies. But they're sort of they're kind of ridiculous, and you can't really imagine them really, you know, reaching mass market adoption. You know, these things are just too crazy. It's like this one is from the Chindoga book from 1995, and it's it's this kind of device for taking self portraits uh, on a stick. And yeah, okay, but I just couldn't imagine people really using this uh, in the world. But if you look at the history of technology, it's basically the same story. From Ashwellian hand axes to pencils to toasters to chindogu, you have, you have the human being, you have a piece of hardware. And the hardware is augmenting the human being. Okay? The, the, the hardware is making the human better at something. But in the 20th century, something new happened. Something new kind of got interposed between the two, and that's software. That now you can have a human interacting with software and the software interacting with hardware, and vice versa. Um, I think, you know, looking back at the 20th century, perhaps the, the, big, the greatest example of these three things working in, in harmony would be the, the Apollo landings, right? Required uh, amazing cooperation. Oh, and by the way, since we were just talking about selfie sticks, I want to point out that this picture here is one of the very few examples of an everyone elsey. This is a, a picture of, taken by Michael Collins, and in the picture you've got uh, Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, and every human being alive <laughs> except Michael Collins. It's an everyone elsey. Um, but but to, to reach the moon, to go there, I mean, it required incredible, incredible human beings, incredible hardware. Uh, and incredible software. I'm not sure that it would have been possible to get to the moon without the software that Margaret Hamilton was, was writing for the program. And ever since then, it seems like the trend has been for, for the, the hardware to become less relevant. And it becomes more and more about the software, right? And interacting directly with the software and not caring too much about the hardware. This idea of ubiquitous computing, right? Of design dissolving in behavior. 
if you take this idea of the hardware becoming irrelevant, in a way, that's sort of what was at the heart of the World Wide Web project that Tim Berners-Lee started at CERN. Right? So in, this, in the environment of CERN, which is an amazing place, but it's, it's pretty chaotic. Like, there's no hierarchy there. Nobody can dictate, right, this is the, this is the hardware we're all going to use. Everyone uses whatever they want. Right? Everyone uses whatever they like. And interoperability was a bit of a problem, uh, managing all that information. Um, that was the problem that Tim Berners-Lee was trying to solve. And this idea of making the hardware irrelevant, we sort of take it for granted now, right? You make a website, and you take it for granted that it doesn't matter whether you've got a Mac or a PC or a Linux machine or Android or iOS or whatever, you'd still be able to access a web page. But it was kind of revolutionary. The idea that the, the, it would be independent of hardware. And the World Wide Web itself is this great example of a technology that builds on all the technologies that have come before, right? Like we, we make things on the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web itself is sort of built on the internet, which you can't have an internet without having computers. You can't have computers without electricity. You can't have electricity without the Industrial Revolution. Right? And it seems like there's this inevitable progress towards the World Wide Web, but in some ways it's also a bit like natural selection in that there is an inevitability to, to the overall trend, but the details were not set in stone. Like Something like the World Wide Web was probably inevitable, but the World Wide Web that we got, that was not inevitable. Right? Something like the internet was bound to happen, but the specific kind of internet we got, that was down to you know, the work of the people thinking about it and doing it. So there's, there's, this, there's this kind of balance between inevitability and, I guess, design, in a way, or uh, the arc of history. Um, and the World Wide Web itself, you could kind of break down into separate technologies, right? That the, it's this collection of, of mostly three things. You've got the, the, the protocol, the hypertext transfer protocol. You've got URLs for identifying uh, things. And HTML, the very simple format, right? The hypertext mark markup language. Now, Tim Berners-Lee created these things. Turns out this wasn't the hard part. Not to belittle his achievements, but just creating formats or creating protocols, not necessarily the tricky part. The tricky part is to convince people to use your format or convince people to use your protocol. And when it comes to you know, convincing people, um, I always think of, of Grace Hopper, Rear Admiral Grace Hopper, uh, computer programmer, inventor of the compiler. Uh, we wouldn't have the software history we have today without that. And she used to get very frustrated with people being unwilling to change uh, their way. She, she used to say that the, the most dangerous phrase in the English language is, we've always done it that way, right? Um, and she famously said that humans are allergic to change. I think she's, she was onto something. Now what she would do, she, she said, humans are allergic to change, and I try to change that, right? Try to, try to fight against it. But what I think Tim Berners-Lee did was to acknowledge humans are allergic to change, but instead of fighting it, kind of go with it. So make these things you're trying to get people to use, make them as familiar as possible. Don't create something from scratch. Build on what's already there. So the hypertext transfer protocol is built on top of TCP IP, right? Don't create a new internet. Use what's already there. So again, Tim Berners-Lee building on the work of, of Bob Kahn and Vint Cerf. URLs are built on top of the domain name system and the work that John Postel had already put in there. And HTML, this, this simple format, was very much built on an existing format that was in use at CERN, which is a flavor of SGML, Standard Generalized Markup Language. In fact, if you were to look at the flavor of SGML in use at CERN at the time, you would see elements like this. These are all from CERN SGML. So what Tim Berners-Lee did was he took what people were already familiar with, and that allowed people to get stuck in with HTML pretty quickly. It wasn't this whole new thing they had to learn. You could actually take a, a CERN SGML document, change the file extension to .htm, and it was a valid HTML document. I think that's really smart, and that's, I think, partly responsible for the, the adoption of, of HTML at CERN. Of course, since then, we've, 
We've added many more elements to HTML, right? We've got all these elements for, for adding more semantic richness when we're marking up documents. Where it gets really interesting is the, the sort of magical elements, the elements that come with behaviors built in. These are the more powerful elements. These have all been designed, and designed in a, in a clever way. If you think about the way that all these elements work, canvas, video, audio, you got your opening tag, your closing tag, and you can put stuff in between the opening and closing tags to act as a fallback for the browsers that don't yet support Canvas or video or audio or whatever. Uh, that's really smart. It means you can start using these things before they're you know, supported in every browser. And that's not an accident. Right? That's specifically by design. And you can see that at work in the HTML design principles. Right, that this stuff should degrade gracefully in older or less capable user agents, even when making use of new elements, attributes, APIs, and content models. So the idea that you can, you can add to the language and add richness and add these kind of magic elements, uh, but still be thinking about backwards compatibility. That's a very, very smart design principle. Um, I'm a sucker for design principles. I like them a lot. In fact, I collect them. Uh, I've got this URL, principles.adaptio.com, where I, I gather design principles together. And there's, there's personal design principles. There's design principles from organizations, from software, from hardware. You can find the Chindogu design principles listed there. And I think one of the reasons I'm fascinated by, by principles is sort of where they sit in, in the flow of, of building something, building a technology, is that you kind of begin with the goals, right? The vision, what you're trying to build. And then the principles come out of that. The principles should be influenced by what the, what the big picture vision is. And then from that, you get the patterns. So the goals influence the principles, the principles influence the patterns. So in the case of the World Wide Web, the goals are, let's make hardware irrelevant. The principles are the HTML design principles we just saw. And then the patterns are the individual elements of HTML influenced by those principles. Um, and that's how we get these elements, right? And when you're looking at things like this, something, something new gets added to the browser. There's a new browser API, there's a new element, whatever it happens to be. Inevitably, when you're deciding whether or not to, to use this technology, you ask yourself a question. You ask yourself, well, how well does it work? How well does this technology accomplish what it claims to accomplish? And this is a reasonable question to ask. It's a good question to ask when you're evaluating any technology. But I think there's a more important question to ask than how well does it work, and that's to ask, how well does it fail? How well does the technology fail? Because in the case of HTML elements that we're just looking at, they fail really well by design, right? The fact that you can have fallback content in between the opening and closing tags, smart. They work well and they fail well. Um, so for example, let's say we're looking at, at some, a new bit of CSS. Um, let's say CSS shapes. And we go to can I use and we type in the thing we want to use and we see some red and we see some green. And maybe we're going to make our decision based on the amount of green versus the amount of red. But that, uh, that sea of red and green doesn't answer the question, how well does it fail, right? Browser support doesn't tell you what happens in the browser where it's not supported. So let's say I was using something like CSS shapes. Um, here I'm using it on my website, and see, I've, I've used CSS shapes here to have a shape outside circle, so the text kind of wraps around the circle. So it's working well, it's doing what it says it's gonna do, but what happens in one of those browsers that doesn't support CSS shapes? Well, this happens. The text just goes straight, okay? So it fails well. In this case, it's like, well, that's fine. I'm going to go with it. So just looking at the browser support on something like caniuse.com wouldn't have told me how well this technology fails. In this case, it fails very well. So, so let's use that. Let's use that question as a, as a lens to look at some of the technologies that are you know, on everybody's lips, that are the hot topics in, in web development and see how well they hold up to that question, how well does it fail? Um, so let's start with uh, service workers. Who's heard of service workers? Okay, quite a few hands. Who's using service workers? Not so many. Interesting, so a lot of people have heard of it, but you're currently evaluating whether or not to use it. So I put to you that the question, how well does it fail, is a good question to ask. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details of how service workers work. They're, it's kind of a weird technology to get your head around. Like, 
Technically, it's a JavaScript file, but it's not like your other JavaScript files. And you shouldn't treat it like your other JavaScript files. I always think that service workers happen to be written in JavaScript, but it's, it's a whole other world, because they kind of get installed on the user's machine like a cookie, but a cookie that can execute JavaScript. It's, yeah, it's kind of scary. It's like, it's like you've, you're putting a virus on the user's machine. You're making a man in the middle attack on your own website. Um, but it's incredibly powerful because it can sit there and listen to network requests and pull things out of the cache and do all this great stuff. Um, it can be a huge, huge aid to performance, right? So the first time someone visits your site, it's a regular interaction. Then the service worker gets installed. And from then on, it can sit there listening and go, oh, when, when you receive a request for the CSS or the JavaScript or the, um, you know, the icon imagery, don't go all the way out to the network. Just grab it from the cache. Well, something like that. Or at the very least, you can, make a, you can make a cool little offline page for your own site. Like um, the Guardian have an offline page now, which is a crossword puzzle. So you're on the train. Inevitably, public transport always comes up when you're discussing offline situations, right? You're on the train. You're trying to read that Guardian article. Oh, I can't get to it. But here's a crossword puzzle, right? Cute little thing. But there's a lot of power in service workers. Um, so you got the cache. You got the network. Potentially notifications. Right? So service worker gives you access to all this cool stuff. How well does it work? Yeah, it works pretty well. I mean, you've got you to get your head around it and learn. You, know, you have to understand promises and then this cache API, the fetch API. There's some stuff to get your head around. There's no magic behavior. Service worker won't give you anything straight out of the box. You've got to tell it exactly what to do. But yeah, it works. OK. And we look at the can I use, and we see there's some green, but there's also a lot of red. And you might think, ah, oh, well, not enough support. But as we saw from looking at CSS shapes, this doesn't tell us the whole picture. Because this doesn't answer the question, how well does it fail? That's the question we need to ask. So how well do service workers fail? They fail really well. They fail really well because remember when I was describing what happens with a service worker getting installed? The first time someone comes to your site, there is no service worker. There can't possibly be. And so you've still got to you know, design for that situation. And then the service worker gets installed on the user's machine. And from then on, you can get all the benefits from performance and an offline page and caching, all this good stuff. But those are enhancements, right? And it's, it's been designed to be used as an enhancement to what you've already got. In fact, it's really difficult to make a web page or website or web app depend on a service worker. You kind of have to script it as an enhancement to what you've already got. And because of that, there's no reason not to use it even if it was only supported in one browser or two browsers. Because you're not going to do any damage to the browsers that don't support service workers. In fact, every browser, when they first reach your website, every browser doesn't support service workers. Right? Even the ones that later will. Right? So it fails really, really well by design. There's, there's a commonality in the kind of the design thinking behind the HTML format and the design thinking behind service workers. I think it's really, really smart the way they've designed it. Okay, so service workers, they fail really well. Let's look at web components. That's a hot topic. That's, that's a buzzword I've been hearing for a few years now at this point. Who's heard of web components? OK, good chance. Who's using web components? And I mean the real thing now. All right, <laughs> one person is using web components. <laughs> so again, a lot of people heard it, a lot of people evaluating, should I be using this technology or not? Um, web components are an interesting one because they're not a technology at all. Right? They're this, it's, it's, a, it's an umbrella term for a group of technologies where you have custom elements. It's, a, it's its own spec. And you've got the sinister sounding shadow DOM. Uh, not as scary as it sounds. And there's other bits too, HTML imports and templates and all this other stuff. And, and it's all sort of wrapped up under this web components umbrella. Uh, and the idea is that kind of, well, we've already got these, these great elements in HTML, but it takes a while to design them and get them through the standards process and showing up in browsers. That process is kind of slow. The idea of web components is that you could make your own magical elements, right? You just, you just, Make up your own custom elements, they're called, right? And you can name them anything you like as long as they've got a hyphen in them. That's the, that's the one gotcha. It's just a kind of a long-term agreement between developers and browser makers. To, there will never be a native HTML element that has a hyphen in it 
So it's kind of a safe namespace to use. As long as you name your custom element with a hyphen, you're good to go. Now, if you just uh, go ahead and start using one of these custom elements like this, you're effectively using a span, right? By itself, it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. You have to kind of activate it and turning it, turn it into this magical thing. Uh, and one of the ways of doing that is with this uh, HTML imports technology, which also falls under the Web Components banner. So you can link off to your set of instructions, which can be HTML and CSS and JavaScript. But the important thing here is that this is entirely encapsulated to the scope of that element, and there's no leakage. Now, that's the dream we've been chasing for years, right? Scoped JavaScript, scoped CSS, to not have this clash of, of styles, not have this clash of, of behavior. I mean, that's kind of the thinking behind, behind you know, React components or all the pattern libraries and design systems we're building these days is, is all about encapsulation modularity. Well, that's the, that's the dream of web components. And the idea being then that if one person has made a web component entirely encapsulated, that someone else could just take it and drop it into their site and it just works, right? No dependencies. Um, so that sounds like a pretty cool idea. How well does it work? There's a lot of moving parts. Like I said, there's, it's not that there's one web component spec that you have to wait to be supported. It's there's all different parts of the spec. Uh, so you have to kind of look individually. Here I'm looking at custom elements. Not great support right now in the browser. But as we saw from CSS shapes and service workers, this doesn't tell the whole story because the really important question is how well does it fail? So how well do web components fail? That's where it gets interesting, because the answer to how well does it fail when it comes to web components is it depends. It depends on how you're going to use the web components. Because you could take a leaf out of the HTML design principles and design your web components like this. Right? So let's say you're making some cool carousel -y kind of image gallery custom element, but in your page you've already got some images and you kind of wrap it in this custom element. Now this is smart because if web components are supported, you can sort of uplift it to become this, this swishy thing with animations and swiping, all that. But if web components aren't supported, well, you still got the images. You still got the core content available. So it would fail really well if you designed your web component like this. But when I look at most of the examples of web components out there, what I see is this no thought given to how well they fail, and entirely just assuming that all the moving parts are available, specifically that the JavaScript is always going to be there to lift it up and turn it into this magical element. I think that's a bit of a shame, right? In fact, there's, there's entire uh, showcases for web components that work like this. The Polymer project is a library of web components from Google, and they've built an entire shop uh, using Polymer and this is what the HTML for the shop looks like, right? One body element with this shop app custom element and then JavaScript. And all the magic is happening in the JavaScript with the assumption that that JavaScript is running, that JavaScript is available. I find this a terrible shame, right? But on the plus side, it's early days. It's still early days with web components. And we could set the course. We could, you know, make a decision that, no, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to have some set of best practices, a set of design principles, right? And we could collectively decide we're going to think about backwards compatibility, which I think is good for the adoption of these technologies. Like I say, service workers, one of the reasons I got stuck in and started using it was when I realized, oh, there's no harm to using it in the browsers that don't support it, so I might as well. Whereas if you're doing web components like this, there is harm done to the browsers that don't support it. So it's kind of in our hands. See, the, the amazing and powerful thing about web components is that they give us developers the same power that previously only browser makers had. But the scary thing about web components is that they give us developers the same power that previously only browser makers had. So with great power, responsibility, right? Yeah, we, we need to be aware of that. I, I see a commonality between service workers and web components in that they're both, they're both kind of these umbrella technologies. Like a service worker itself is just a script. And within that, you get access to the Fetch API, the Cache API, Notifications API, 
all this kind of stuff. And web components, like I said, that's not a spec in itself. That's this umbrella term for custom elements, shadow DOM, HTML imports, all this other stuff. So they're umbrella terms. And they themselves kind of fall into this other umbrella term, which is the extensible web. It's kind of a school of thought, like Chindogu, but for the web. Um, the idea that, again, that we developers should be given access to these low-level bits of the browser, and that we should be the ones coming up with with new APIs and new elements and new ways of doing things. There's a CSS equivalent too, which is the Houdini project, which is again giving us access to that low level stuff. But like I say, it's not, it's not a spec, it's not you know, an API, it's just a phrase, the extensible web. And there's a manifesto, there's the extensible web manifesto. And I think, well, it's just a phrase, just a word. Right. But words can be powerful. Ajax is just a word. Right? The technologies behind Ajax already existed before Jesse James Garrett coined the term, but having that word to talk about this stuff, that, that really helped adoption. Responsive web design, just words, just a phrase. Like everything that's defined in responsive web design by Ethan already existed. Fluid grids, fluid images, media queries. Right? Those technologies already existed, but by giving us a, a phrase to talk about something, it can be quite powerful to the adoption of a technology. Or here's another phrase you might have heard. Who's heard of progressive web apps? Okay. Anybody building progressive web apps? Oh, okay. Again, it's an umbrella phrase. Um, this is a term uh, created by Frances Berryman and her husband, Alex Russell, to describe a, a kind of web page that's doing a bunch of things. It's got to be responsive and performance and all this. But at a technical level, it's basically a combination of a few things. First of all, that your site must be running on HTTPS, which is a good idea anyway, and is required if you want to run service workers. So you've got to be running on HTTPS, got to have a service worker installed. It could be a very simple service worker, just doing a custom offline page or something. Uh, and you've got to have this manifest file, which is just a JSON file. Uh, no relation to the manifest that went with app cache, if anybody ever played around with that. This is just a, a name clash. Um, the manifest file is literally a JSON file that contains metadata about your site, like the name, the, uh, the icons, the colors, that kind of stuff. All the, all the meta crap that we usually shove in the head of our documents. Um, and you've got to write it three different ways for three different browsers. The idea now is that we'll have an external file we link to and say, here's all my meta crap over here. So, but if you have these three things, uh, HTTPS, a service worker, and a manifest file, then you have uh, a progressive web app, according to the definition, right? Uh, and, and Google are really pushing this progressive web app, which is great. They're, they're kind of dangling a carrot in front of us, which is that if you, uh, if you, if you fulfill those criteria, and a user visits your site on uh, Chrome for Android, like more than two times or something, they'll get prompted to add your site to their home screen, at which point it behaves pretty much exactly like a native app, right? It'll be in the app switcher, launches just like an app, um, pretty sweet. So the technologies underlying progressive web apps, fantastic stuff, right? The, the benefits you could possibly get from this, yeah, this is, this is looking good. Such a shame then that kind of like with web components, when I see the, the poster children for progressive web apps, I get a bit depressed. Start seeing a return to the bad old days of you know, subdomains for specific devices. The uh, Washington Post made a progressive web app, stick it on a separate subdomain, and then turn away traffic, even if you're using a browser that supports all those technologies, right? In this case, I'm visiting in a desktop browser and it's telling me to come back with a mobile browser. Oh, how the tables have turned. It was not that long ago that we were being turned away on our mobile devices. Now here we are on a desktop device being told, no, you've got to come back with mobile. But come on, we solved this problem, right? Responsive design, the hardware shouldn't matter, making hardware irrelevant, right? Separate subdomains, for, no, no. Like the whole point of a progressive web app to me is that those technologies can be added to any existing website. Anything can be a progressive web app. It's not something you create from scratch and put in a separate subdomain and, uh, and make a separate thing. You take what you've already got. I mean, I've turned just about everything I've made into a progressive web app, according to the definition. And you know, some of that stuff you might consider app-like, but you know, I've got a community website and 
Technically, it's a progressive web app. It fulfills all the criteria. My blog is a progressive web app, according to the criteria. I put a book or two online, and they are progressive web apps. So now books are apps. Uh, and even a single page of design principles is a progressive web app, according to those criteria. Technologies kind of need to sell themselves. I get that, right? They need to make their case. And when you go to the home page for a specific framework or library or something, they're going to they're gonna sell you on the benefits of using that technology. But something to watch out for is to ask yourself, well, who benefits? Who benefits from this technology? And on the web, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw a very broad distinction here. I'll say on the web, broadly, technology is going to benefit developers or users, or both. I would say maybe 80 to 90% of technology is benefit a developer and benefit a user. Um, but sometimes they benefit one at the cost of the other. Like I would say evaluating something like service workers will as clear benefit to the user in terms of performance and user experience, right? With that caching and, and offline pages, great stuff. It's kind of a tax on the developer because now we've got a whole new thing to learn. How do service workers work? What's this API I have to understand, right? So it benefits the user to the cost of the developer, I would say. Now, personally, I'm okay with that. I, I'm okay with taking the hit as a developer as long as there's some benefit to the end user. Um, in the HTML design principles is one of my favorite design principles because, yes, I have favorites. Um, it's called the priority of constituencies, which is, in case of conflict, consider users over authors over implementers over theoretical purity. Users, authors, that's us, implementers, that's browser makers, theoretical purity. I like that priority of constituencies. I think it's good. And I, I probably have a similar level of priorities when I'm evaluating technologies. I will, I'll take the hit as a developer as long as there's a benefit for the users. But as a developer, I also really want my life to be easy, right? I'm a lazy developer. I want tools to make my life easy. But when we're evaluating the tools, I think we need to make a distinction. And I've, been, I've been trying to think how to frame this, 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 this distinction between what I'm going to call inward-facing tools and outward-facing tools. The inward-facing tools are the tools for developers. The outward-facing tools, the technologies, they're for users. So inward-facing tools are effectively the things that are on your computer, right? the things that help you get your work done. Uh, version control systems, build tools, task runners, all that kind of stuff. Right? They sit on your computer, but at the end of the day, what gets output is still HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So they're not directly affecting the user. Now you might say, there's an indirect effect. Anything that helps a developer work faster de facto means the, there's going to be a better user experience, and that's true. But I'm just talking about things that directly touch developers versus things that directly touch users. Now, when it comes to these inward-facing technologies, the things that sit on your computer, and evaluating those technologies, my attitude is whatever you want. Go crazy. I don't care. Because, you know, it's not on my computer, it's on your computer. And there's no direct effect to the end user. So you go ahead and use whatever tools you want on your computer. Use one of them, none of them, all of them. Doesn't matter to me, doesn't matter to the user. But we can't use the same criteria when we're evaluating technologies that do directly affect the user. These are the technologies that are written in the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript that the user has to download before we get the benefit as developers. Now, in recent years, of course, there's been you know, interesting movement where you see these uh, JavaScript libraries in particular kind of moving back over to be, to be doing both. They can simultaneously be on the server or in the client, uh, which I think is a really good and interesting development. But a lot of these you know, CSS frameworks, JavaScript libraries, that kind of stuff, they have a tax on the end user. They make our life easier as developers, but at a price to the user. Now, I'm not saying don't use them. I'm just saying consider that. When you're evaluating the technology, consider the hit that the user might take for you, the developer, to get the benefit and weigh up whether you think it's worth it. And a lot of times it is worth it, like the benefit you get from these these frameworks and libraries. And also ask, of course, how well do they fail?
Now, when it so these are the outward-facing tools, the outward-facing technologies. And when it comes to evaluating those outward-facing technologies, there's all sorts of things to ask, right? Uh, what's the community support like? Uh, what's the file size like? That's pretty vital. Um, what's the browser support like? Uh, really good questions to ask, but not the most important question. The most important question to ask of these outward-facing technologies is, what are the assumptions that are baked into the technology? Right, what, what assumptions have been made in the, in the creation of these tools? Because I guarantee you, there are assumptions in there. There must be, because these tools and technologies were created by human beings. And we cannot help but put our assumptions into our tools. Software, like all technologies, is inherently political. Code inevitably reflects the choices, biases, and desires of its creators. Right? It, it's just inevitable. We talk about opinionated software, but the truth is all software is opinionated to some degree. And once you understand that, then it's okay. Then what you're looking for is you're looking for uh, technologies that match your own philosophy. And this is how you can end up in a situation where you've got like one group of developers saying, oh, this framework sucks. And another group saying, no, this framework rocks. Right? And they're both right and they're both wrong because it's entirely subjective and it depends on your, your philosophy. Because if you if you found a technology, a tool that matches your philosophy, then you'll work with that tool and you'll work faster. It's an accelerant. But if you're trying to use a technology or tool that doesn't match your own assumptions and philosophy, you're going to be butting heads with the tool the whole time. It's going to, it's going to slow you down. So yeah, all technology uh, is, is um, inherently political. It contains biases, and all software is effectively opinionated software. Uh, at ClearLeft, we, we tried making unopinionated software. This is an open source project started live at ClearLeft called Fractal. It's for making pattern libraries, design systems, all that good stuff. And the, the whole underlying principle was that it should be as unopinionated as possible, right? It shouldn't make any assumptions about uh, the build process, it shouldn't make any assumptions about templating languages. Try to be as agnostic as possible. Turns out it's really, really hard. Right? Every time you're writing a piece of documentation, you have to use an example, and then you've made a choice. Right? You've, you've, you've favored one thing over another. So it's really, really hard to, to make unopinionated software. Try as you might. But I don't want to give the impression that you know, software or technology comes with these biases, and there's no way you can battle against them. That's like it's set in stone. Because I do think that when you're aware of it, um, you can end up using technologies for purposes other than what they were intended for. In fact, the history of technology is filled with this. Like, um, you know, when uh, Alexander Graham Bell made the telephone, he thought that people would listen to concerts at a distance. And when uh, Edison created the phonograph, he thought people would record conversations, like one side of a conversation, and the other person records the other side of a conver conversation. And of course, those technologies ended up being used in the exact opposite way. Um, so, so it is possible for a technology to end up being used for something completely different than that which was originally intended. Like, for example, I want to bring up Hedy Lamarr, star of Silver Screen at the start of the 20th century. Um, she was uh, in Europe married to an Austrian arms manufacturer. She used to kind of sit in on the meetings after the Anschluss. She's, uh, she's sitting in on the meetings with the Nazis and taking notes. Nobody's paying her any attention. She manages to get out of Europe and make her way to America. And during the war, she wants to do her part, um, particularly um, after an incident involving a refugee ship that was sunk by a U-boat. And part of the problem was um, you're trying to take out these U-boats with torpedoes. Uh, and you've got radio-controlled torpedoes but if the enemy managed to find the frequency of the radio channel that the torpedo is using, they can just jam it, and now your torpedo is effectively dead in the water. So together with this uh, composer, George Antiel, she came up with a system whereby the, the controller and the torpedo are constantly switching frequencies. They're hopping from one frequency to another, and now it's much harder to jam. All right, fine. So it's a technology created for uh, attacking U-boats in World War II doesn't seem to be very relevant to us today. But I'm guessing those devices you've got with you have got Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or even GPS. And every single one of those technologies uses frequency hopping. Every single one of them is, is using the technology that Hedy Lamarr created with. 
So I don't know, trying to evaluate technology and trying to figure out does, does technology you know, have a, a direction? Does it have a, a desire to go in one direction or another? I'm not sure. I, I do like the, the Kranzberg's law of technology, right? The technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. What I do find disempowering is this feeling that change is coming and you have to get with it and it's inevitable and there's nothing you can do about it. And that's whether we're talking about JavaScript libraries and building web development or whether we're talking about the world and self-driving cars and uh, AI or any of this stuff. This idea that it's inevitable, you got to get on board, it's the future, take it, right? I, I find disempowering. This idea of technological determinism, that it's technology is setting the, the, the stage of history, and we're just along for the ride. I don't like that feeling. And the most extreme example of that would be the idea of the technological singularity. It's kind of like the rapture of the nerds, right? Um, an idea that comes from cosmology, where you've got you know, a, a singularity created when a star collapses and turns into a black hole, right? A single point that's so dense nothing can escape, even light. And there's an event horizon around the black hole. And the point is from outside, there is literally no way to see beyond the event horizon. There's no way for information to, to get out. And with a technological singularity, it's the same idea that technology is going to increase so rapidly and so powerfully that there will be an event horizon. And from our perspective today, it is literally impossible for us to see what's on the other side of that event horizon. Thing is, I reckon we've probably been through a few singularities. Like if you look at uh, the agricultural revolution, when we changed from being hunter-gatherers to being farmers, that lifestyle was literally unimaginable to the hunter-gatherer lifestyle before it. And then when we got the industrial revolution, completely changed how we live, how we work. That lifestyle is completely unimaginable to the agricultural people. But the interesting thing is that those singularities didn't wipe out what came before. We still have agricultural society. We still have hunter-gatherers. So it's more like they live alongside. And we're probably going through another singularity right now, some kind of informational singularity. But I don't think it's going to wipe out everything that's going to, that came before. It's going to maybe live alongside it. Kevin Kelly is an interesting writer who talks about technology, and he writes books with these provocative titles like What Technology Wants and The Inevitable, which makes it sound like he's into technological determinism. But his, his point is a bit more subtle than that. In fact, in one of his books, he makes the point that no technology has ever gone extinct. And he doesn't mean that it's sitting in a museum somewhere. He means somewhere in the world, somebody is using a technology that's old and past its sell-by date, but it still lives on. Um, he does say there is an inevitability to the broad march of technology, but not to the individual pieces and how things end up in our world, that we have control over that and that we can, we can set the flow of history. Uh, I like that. When I was talking about you know, the, the World Wide Web, the internet, that something like the web was inevitable, something like the internet was inevitable, but the web we got, the internet we got was not inevitable. I think that's true of all technologies. And looking at Kevin Kelly and his impressive facial hair, you might think that he's, uh, he's Amish. He's not Amish, but he does describe himself as being Amish-ish. Because he spent time with the Amish and evaluated their use of technology. And they get a bad rap. People think that they reject technology, and that's not true. The Amish are steadily adopting technology at their pace. They are slow geeks. And I think we could all probably benefit from being slow geeks, that we could be a bit more Amish-ish, not necessarily in our facial hair or dress sense, but in how we question technology when we question how well does it work, but just as importantly when we question how well does it fail, and we ask of the technology who benefits, and perhaps most important of all when we ask what are the assumptions. Because when I look back at the, the sweep of history, I don't see technology as being the driver and that human beings were just along for the ride. I see the history was made by people. I mean, remarkable people, but people nonetheless. And, you know, who else is remarkable? You're remarkable. So I look forward to seeing how you're going to evaluate technologies and what you're going to build. You're not going to have the motto, you know, it's the future, take it. You're going to say, it's the future, make it. I look forward to seeing what you make. Thank you.